happy Mother's Day. I love you too. One thing we all have in common, we all have a mother. So today, remember your mother. My mom's already gone on. She was a very generous woman. I thank God for her. If your mom is still on the earth, just take some time today to let her know you appreciate her. But we all have a mother. And even if she wasn't the best mother, she gave you life. She gave you that gift. So we can all be thankful for our mothers. Um, I want to share today a very non-traditional Mother's Day message. Can I do that? Non-traditional, all right? About six or eight years ago, time, you know, flies and you don't remember, but I, I spoke on a Father's Day from Isaiah chapter 32, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, Isaiah chapter 32. And I spoke from the first eight verses which are directed to men. And ever since then, I've wanted to preach the second half of that chapter because that's directed to the women. So when pastor asked me, I knew exactly what my text was going to be. And I find something interesting in Isaiah chapter 32 as I said, the first eight chapters deal with the men, second half deals with the women, and it made me remember kingdom order. Who was created first? Adam was created first, and then Eve, right? And Paul, in the New Testament, spoke first to the men. He said, husbands, love your wives, before he said, wives, respect your husbands. So in kingdom order, the roles of men and women are intrinsically connected in ways that we do not fully understand. But how many of you know a lot of things about God we don't understand, but we know to be true? All right? So hold that thought because we're going to return to it at the end. And um, today, even though we're going to focus on the second half of Isaiah 32, we're going to uh, focus on those scriptures that are directed to the women, I promise you, this is for the young and the old. This is for the male and the female. Because God's word is for everybody. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are awesome creator Savior, Deliverer, Healer, Baptizer. You are the God of the Word. When you spoke it, it came to be. And Lord, we thank you for the anointing that's on your Word. I pray, Lord, today that you'll open our eyes and our ears and our hearts and our minds to receive your Word. I pray, Lord, that you'll enable me to communicate it to touch our lives and change them for the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah chapter 32, starting in verse 9. You women who are so complacent, rise up and listen to me. You daughters who feel secure, hear what I have to say. In little more than a year, you who feel secure, will tremble. The grape harvest will fail, and the harvest of fruit will not come. I want to draw your attention to three things. I want to draw your attention to the word complacent, to the words feel secure, and to the fact that when either one of those are present, the harvest of fruit doesn't come. How many of you were here Wednesday night? Wednesday night, Dave, I don't know if he's here, but Dave spoke out, I think it was Dave, spoke out on Wednesday night, and he taught us something about grapes. He said, good grapes, the best grapes, 
only grow on first year freshly pruned vines. Is that what he said? Did I get it right? So that tells me that the vine dresser cannot be complacent. Because if he doesn't prune every year, then in a little more than a year, that harvest is not going to come. He cannot be complacent. He has to constantly be tending. I also want to talk just a minute about feeling secure. How many of you know that you can feel something that's not true? Right? You can feel ugly, but you're not. You can feel afraid when God is with you. You can feel unloved when you are loved beyond measure and beyond comprehension. We can feel pretty secure. But we don't need to focus on how we feel, but we want to focus on God's word. I am who I say, who you say I am, right? That's what pastor's been teaching us. Um, a little more than a year ago, COVID hit, right? The pandemic came, and who would have known in that year how much our lives would have changed? So let's talk for just a minute about that other word that I uh, brought up to you first, complacent. Let's look at the word complacent. I knew that if I was ever going to share this message, I had to understand what the word complacent means. And I always thought that contentment and complacency were the same thing. I think if you look them up, they might even be synonyms. And the word tells us that godliness with contentment is great gain. So how can contentment be good and complacency be bad if they're the same thing? They can't be the same thing. So it's like, Lord, help me understand what's the difference? What's the nuances? And then I ran across this guy named Scott Miker, and he's got it figured out. He's got this whole 14-week course that you can take. Well, I didn't take the course, but I did steal from his website, okay? And this is what he said. He said, being content means that you don't need more to be happy. Everything that you need at this moment, you have. And it's a drastic shift from what we're taught. He also says complacency is different from being content being complacent is similar to being lazy. Ouch. Often when we, ref when we get upset with our current situation but refuse to work to improve, we're being complacent. The difference between contentment and complacency is a subtle one. Being content means being happy. Being complacent means refusing to work to improve. Pastor told us just a few minutes ago, your joy is your choice, right? Contentment has an element of gratefulness, of thankfulness, of acknowledging, thank you, God, I have all I need. Contentment, I think, leans toward the physical, material things. Complacency, on the other hand, has a little bit of denial, right? I don't need to change. Has a little bit of lack of motivation. How many things in your life do you want to be different, but you don't want to pay the price for it to be different? <laughs> I want to be 30 years old, half my age. I want that body. I want that mind. I don't want to go to the gym every day, <laughs> right? There are areas in our life where we're a little complacent. But if we look at complacency as a spiritual thing, complacency 
as something to do with our character and something to do with our spiritual life, we cannot afford to be complacent. Because if we are, what did Isaiah say would happen? The harvest would not come. The fruit that we so desperately want in our lives and in the lives of those we love will not come. Again, contentment is about the physical, material, external. Complacency is about the character, the spirit. And just real quick, I'll remind you, Paul said godliness with contentment is great gain in 1 Timothy. And in Philippians, again, he said, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Again, this just confirms contentment is dealing with the physical, the stuff, the food. And complacency leads toward the spiritual. And we cannot afford to be complacent. Our spirits cry out for more, right? More of you. Jesus, more of you. I want there to be less of me and more of you. And how about this one? More love, more power, more of you in my life. That's where it comes from, right? Do you want more? Yeah, me too. Me too. That's the cry of my heart. The heart's cry is for more. And until we get it past our head and into our heart and into our motivation and into our determination, we're not going to see the results. So let's talk about our heart's cry for a minute, and we're going to return to Isaiah chapter 32, starting in verse 11. Tremble. You complacent women. Shudder, you daughters who feel secure. Strip off your fine clothes and wrap yourself in rags. Beat your breast for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vines, and for the land of my people. A land overgrown with thorns and briars. Yes, mourn for all houses of merriment and for the city of Reveille. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> I told you it was going to be non-traditional, right? In Isaiah, we see again the words complacent, feeling secure, and Isaiah is telling them, throw off your complacency. Get rid of your complacency and cry out for the land of my people. They were crying out to Israel. They were crying out for Jerusalem. We cry out for America. We cry out for Michigan. We cry out for Battle Creek, Augusta, Richland, Hickory Corners, Lacey. We cry out for our communities. Or do we? It tells us here that their, their land was overgrown with thorns and briars. And I think um, if you think back to the parable of the sower, Jesus just defined for us what those thorns and briars were. So you're, you remember the parable of the sower? Yep. The seed is thrown on the rocks and on the soil and on the good soil, on the path. 
And Jesus said in verse 7 that other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. And then he went on in verse 22 to explain what he was talking about. And he said, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and make it unfruitful. Yeah, we talked about that, didn't we? The Amplified Bible expands it, and it says it this way. The one on whom the seed was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the worries of this life, the distractions of the world, the deceitfulness of the world, the superficial pleasures, the delight of riches, all of those things choke the word, and then it yields no fruit. Jesus said it. Does that sound like America? Does that sound like Battle Creek? Does that sound like your community? Does it make your heart cry? Can you stay complacent? Something else that'll make your heart cry, because after all, you know, this is Mother's Day, and, you know, we all like to cry on Mother's Day. <laughs> Lamentations. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, said this to the women of Israel. Arise, cry out in the night as the watches of the night begin. Pour out your heart like water in the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands to him for the lives of your children who faint from hunger at every street corner. And when I read this, I think of two things. I think first of my sister, Summer, who has a heart to feed. Summer, you'd feed the whole city. I know. And not only does she care about their physical food, she wants to feed them spiritually. And that's the hunger I think this is talking about. People on your street, in your apartment building, on your factory line, in your place of employment, people are fainting from hunger. Now, I'm not good at statistics, but I know that the statistics of obesity are horrible in America, right? I think part of it is because we're trying to feed that hunger deep inside that only God can fill. Amen? Does it make your heart cry? Do you want to stay complacent? <laughs> Do you want to stay in this place on Mother's Day? <laughs> Let's keep going. Let's find the answer. Oh, Lord, we need the answer, and you are the only answer, right? Isaiah chapter 32, starting in verse 14. The fortress will be abandoned, the noisy city deserted, citadel and watchtower will become a wasteland forever, the delight of donkeys and a pasture for flocks. Un until, until what? Say it with me. Until the Spirit is poured out on us from on high. Yeah. Go ahead and clap, Tina. <laughs> yeah. Until the Spirit is poured on us from on high, then the desert, the desert will be a field. And the field will be so fruitful, it'll be like a forest. You'll need a machete to cut through it. Fruit everywhere. When? When the spirit is poured out. So how do we get that spirit? <laughs> when we get rid of our complacency and we cry out to God. Right? Right? Pastor 
has been telling us for years. The secret to revival is prayer. Have you heard him say it? You've heard him, have you heard it once? You've heard it a hundred times. The secret is prayer. And pastor, I apologize to you again. I've been late to the party. It's one thing to know it in your head. It's another thing to know it in your heart and make it your heart's cry, right? Yeah. Some of us have been gathering from 10 to 10, 15 to pray in the sanctuary. And if you get here early on Sunday mornings, you maybe see us. Some of us are walking. Some of us are standing. Some of us are kneeling. Some are sitting. Some of you are doing it with us. You know, some of, some of you are some of us, right? Sunday morning from 10 to 10, 15. Give us 15 for fire and come and join us. That's not for a select group. That's for anybody who's hungry for fire. And I invited the 8.30 service to come. You know, at the time's a little trickier, but, you know, like 8.10 to 8.25 or whatever. Do you remember, like, six or eight weeks ago when the Spirit fell on a Sunday morning 10.30 service? Were you guys here? How many remember it? That morning and the week before that, we had the most people praying in here that we'd ever had. We had 10 or 12 people praying in here. And the spirit fell. Do you want to be complacent? I can't hear you. <laughs> Joel gave this promise, and it was repeated again in Acts. Afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Say that with me. All people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will see dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women. No age limit at either end. And let me just interject here. If you're feeling your age, <laughs> spiritual strength is not dependent on physical strength. Mm -hmm. I'll say it again just because it's so good, right? <laughs> you can be spiritually strong no matter how strong or weak you are physically. And the word says, though outwardly we waste away, because we got these darn earthly bodies, though outwardly we waste away, inwardly we're renewed day by day. You're never too old. Never too old. You're never too young. Man, woman, male, female, child. I'm so thankful for the Holy Spirit. Bill Baker, I'm so thankful for the class that you're doing because until the Spirit is poured out, right, that's where we get the power. That's where we get the power. That's where we get the equipping of the saints. And then you couple that with John Studebaker's class where you're going to find out what to do with that power, right? Right? Amen. Amen. And when all that happens, when we get the Spirit, when we figure out what we're supposed to do with it, Isaiah 32, verse 17, the results, the fruit of that righteousness will be peace. Its effect will be quietness and confidence forever. My people, say that with me, my people, this is God speaking, my people, will live in peaceful dwelling places, in secure homes, in undisturbed places of rest. Though hail flattens the forest and the city is leveled completely, how blessed you will be sowing your seed by every stream and letting your cattle and donkeys range free. Amen. Amen. Though all hell breaks out against you. Oh, I'm sorry, it says hail. Though all hail breaks out against you. 
Have you, did, did anybody see that um, billboard on Capitol Avenue Northeast going north? It had a picture of a house, a house, and then rubble. And it said, you never know when the day before is the day before. Right? You never know. You can't afford to be complacent today because you never know. Do you want to live in peace? Do you want quietness and confidence to be so deep within you that it can't be shaken? Do you want to live in a peaceful dwelling place? Psalm 23, the psalmist said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Doesn't get any worse than the shadow of the valley of the shadow of death, right? If God can handle that, He can handle anything you've got on your plate. Amen. So, if we want this, are we willing to admit it and are we willing to do what it takes to get it? Amen. Let's get rid of that complacency. I want to return in closing to what I said at the beginning about kingdom order. Do you remember what I said about kingdom order? It starts where? It starts with the men, right? Adam was created first and then Eve. Husbands, love your wives before wives respect your husbands. Isaiah chapter 32, the first eight verses to the men before he got to this about the women. So, men, are you ready? I'm going to pick on you from it. It's Mother's Day, right? We're supposed to pick on the men on Mother's Day? <laughs> so, I told you it would be non-traditional. Um, there's a book by a man whose name I cannot pronounce. It's called The Ten Levels of Glory, and it's got some really good nuggets in it, and this is one of them. It is part of the destiny of men to come before the face of God, to deliberately make time for fellowship with the Most High. This is very important, and I cannot stress it enough. God has strongly connected the destiny of a nation, the destiny of America, the destiny of Battle Creek, the destiny of Overflow Church, the destiny of your home and your neighborhood. God has strongly connected it with the calling of men. The blessing on a country, state, city, church, community, lies in the hands of the men of God. Let us pray for them, give them space, and support them. Proverbs tells us that a wise woman builds her house and a foolish one tears it down with her own hands and sometimes with her tongue. Yeah. Gentlemen, I am so thankful for the men of God at Overflow Church. I am. Some of you are already committed to deliberately make time for fellowship with the Most High. If that's you, stand up so we can thank you. And if it's not you, but you want it to be you, then I want you to stand up too. Men of God who say, I am willing to deliberately come before, before God. Now, gentlemen, I need your help. I either need you to come forward or step to the side. I, I don't know if everybody will fit up front, but I need you all up front or, or around the sanctuary. Come on, you're brave, right? If you're brave enough to stand up, you're brave enough to walk up, right? Okay, now, ladies, now it's your turn. I want to fill the house, 
fill the house with the sound of women praying for their men, giving them space and supporting them. Are you ready? All right. Pray in the spirit. Pray with understanding. Pray out loud. Go. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Mm, I love the sound. I love the sound. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right, gentlemen. I want you to turn and face the congregation. I want you to face those beautiful women. And we're going to look at the next paragraph. Then, after we get the kingdom order right, then the wonderful women of the kingdom. Gentlemen, will you look out over the congregation and say that with me? Then the wonderful women of the kingdom they'll also be released for even greater effectiveness and fruit. Not that they're not already barren some. Not that they're not already a little effective. But even greater effectiveness. (laughs) These women to whom we owe so much today, who especially in the West uphold Christianity pray tirelessly, and often fill the vacuum we men have left through our passivity. When we as men stand up, give them a hand, they're standing up. Mm -hmm. When we as men stand up, we will make it easier for women to come before the face of God. The men in our lives Be they fathers, brothers, husbands, neighbors, pastors, teachers. The men in our lives can hold us up or hold us down or hold us back. And these men are standing up saying, I want these women to be released for even greater effectiveness. So now, gentlemen, I want to fill the house with the sound of you praying for the women. Are you ready? Go. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The last slide. She's not going to say she's taking it. 
In closing, the glory of the face of God is not a choice but our duty if we want to see heaven invading earth. Is that your heart's cry? Let's get rid of complacency. Let's cry from our hearts for each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you.